most vulnerable. In the schools now, the federal law says that they have to be, if they can be integrated in the classrooms, they need to be in inclusive classrooms. That means that puts the most vulnerable closer to the bullies, who can get away with it outside of the classroom, in neighborhoods where adults don't see them. That's the problem. That's, that's what I struggled with as a teacher, as a special educator, as an administrator. And another, here's another reality. I know from research that bystanders, a lot of the public schools have programs that say, if you see it, the bystanders out there report it. Some do, but research says that most will not because they're also intimidated by the bullies. So that's one reason why it continues to go on and on. So they're fearful. Everyone involved cries out for protection from this pervasive, this problem that's so pervasive. Parents say, protect my child because I'm trusting you with my most treasured possession. Educators say, protect my class time because it's my desire to teach my curriculum and help my students map, um, prepare for the Common Core Standards. Victims say, protect me because I'm afraid. And the bystanders cry out and say, please protect vulnerable kids because I feel helpless watching them get victimized and I need you to teach me how to help. So the good news is, as an adjunct here at Cairn, I know that educators and parents can teach children how to see others differently. They just need a tool. So how could I be silent? So, sorry. So I wrote the picture book, Hard Eyes, Beth and the Bullies, and it's the first in a series and in Hard Eyes, Beth and the Bullies, a central character, Beth, sees other children with her hard eyes. In this book, she notices a little boy being bullied, running away from the bullies really fast. And so that gives her an idea how to take action non-confrontationally. And at, she's a catalyst of change, where she inspires bystanders to think creatively and solve problems on their own. And in the book, there's um, included questions and answers that adults can use for follow-up questions as they um, talk with their children. And some of the questions are there for parents to talk to children when they suspect that their child is being bullied. They may, I've had, I have an adult son who was bullied all through school. And he oftentimes didn't want to tell me about it because he thought if I intervene, that's just going to escalate the problem. So there, there are questions and answers for parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, and also for educators. And um, in the future series, each book is going to focus on a different reason why children are bullied. The next one that's already been written in the illustrator's work, he's coming here, by the way. Lord willing, he's going to be here. He's in traffic right now, but he's a gifted brother in the Lord. Um, the second one is going to be a child who's an English language learner who gets bullied because of how he speaks, how he looks, what he eats. Other ones are going to be, the third one is already started on a child who has autism that gets bullied. And it, it could, sadly, it could just go on and on in this series. Oh, I keep pushing the wrong button. Anyway, so let me tell you about um, uh, one of the stories that I have. As in, through my career in teaching, I've accumulated what I call favorite problems. And my favorite problems are opportunities for God to really reveal his power in mighty ways. And one of my favorite problems is I had, I, when I taught second grade, I had a boy in my class, Lucas, who was allergic and had asthma. And at the end of the year, we were practicing in the sanctuary at Calvary Chapel, which is huge. <laughs> we, have, we can hold 2,000 people in the sanctuary. And, um, and I noticed his breathing was labored, and God just gave me this sermon to know this was not just a, new, a minor problem. I rushed him to the nurse who told me it was good that I got him there quickly because it could have gone critical very quickly. And they rushed him to the hospital. The parents were able to determine that the, all the pews had been treated with a chemical that was deadly to Lucas. So he couldn't be near that sanctuary for at least two weeks. The problem was he was practicing for the spring program, which was one of the most exciting events of the entire school year. And the very next day was going to be the pep rally for field day that kids love to participate in. And he wouldn't be able to do that. And I thought, no, no, not Lucas. This can't happen to Lucas. So right after the spring program, I went to Matt in the booth and I said, we have an overflow room. The gymnasium on Sundays is used for overflow. How difficult would it be for you to hook up that overflow system? And he said, I can't do it. I don't have enough time for tomorrow. 
And I said, well, we have a nursing mother's room. You know, I know that there's a TV in there. Can you hook that up? And he said, you're not going to fit. This is actually it. You're not going to, there's no way you'll fit 23 students in there. Because my plan was, I didn't want Lucas to feel isolated and miss out. But I thought I could just have, if we could have the whole class join him and we could participate in it remotely. And Matt said, there's no way you're going to get 23 kids fit in that room. And I said, watch me. That's right. But then the challenge was to convince 20, 23 second graders who typically are very selfish to agree to go there. And you know this this is why one of the this is one of my favorite problems because I learned the power of words. All you need to do is speak or write words. And God you God took those kids who normally act selfishly and they acted selflessly because of the, they showed sacrificial love and their compassion for Lucas rallied them to be united to make his life better. It was awesome. Now, these are two more students that I taught. They're young adults now, and I taught them back in second grade. They're brothers. Now, God, I'm grateful because God helped me know how I could help Lucas. But sadly, I can't help these two former students because they've been, I'll say this without crying. If I start crying, cry along with me or just ignore me. I'll, I'll end soon. But yeah, but you will when you hear it. They've been diagnosed with an, um, Neiman Picks disease. It's a form, a rare form of early Alzheimer's that leads to early death. They, the prognosis, prognosis outside of the Lord's intervention, they will die young. Both brothers, they're the only children the parents have. So imagine the parents. The parents, that surely changes what they say, how they act with those boys. And this has set them on a mission to find a cure for their son's illness. But you know, here again, it's a disease, and they're very aware that time is running out. And any time there's an illness, again, with me, with them, it really just eliminates things that are unimportant and clearly puts your focus on what is important. And the point is, we live in a world that has a disease. Sin, suffering, sorrow. And we know the cure. How can we be silent? And our time is running out. You don't have MS, but you know MS. My Savior. My Savior who has told you he's coming again. So your time is running out. What is your rally cry? You know, are you, are, are you listening to the defeated one who's telling you your manuscript's not good enough, your book's not going to sell, you're never going to get an agent or an editor. Your marketing plan isn't what it should be. It won't sell books. L listen to God's voice. God's voice is saying, the one, we serve a God of possibilities. The one who calls you is faithful and he yeah. will do it. Yes, he will. If the difference is not God, not self-esteem, God esteem. He is able. So when that enemy is feeding your head with the lie, the defeated one, listen, listen to hear God say, watch me. Yes. Watch me. I'll move barriers. Are cribs clogging your effort? Are there barriers to your plan? God can move them out of the way and, and make it possible for you to proclaim his message. All you have to do is write his answer. So, let this be a reminder to you. When you think of, think of illness, my illness, their illness, think of the sin in the world as an illness and it, it'll energize you and say, there, our time is running out. And so you have a rally cry. If you don't, just look at the news, pick something. And, um, but here, I just love Hillsong's Hosanna. Do you know this song? It's just a great thing. I just was thinking, thinking about this and singing along with it. I won't sing for you. Um, heal my heart and make it clean. Open my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause as I walk from earth into eternity. That's my prayer. How many of you have that prayer in your heart?